Welcome back everybody. Uh, we are going to proceed with our uh, PowerPoint presentations and my uh, attempt to explain at least some of the concepts and issues. Uh, so we are going to uh, discuss head, neck and trunk on, or in other words axial skeletal system. So I'm gonna go forward and on the next very next slide you can see the skeleton with kind of bluish uh, part and orange part. So the bluish part, of course, is the axial skeletal system, which we are going to discuss um, now. So uh, for the purpose of uh, this conversation, uh, what are the purposes of uh, jaw, ribs and vertebras? So definitely they protect organs. So for example, jaw bones protect tongue. Um, the ribs protect lung, lungs and heart and, and um, so forth provide vital functions uh, of breathing, chewing, and swallowing. Again, that's uh, going to be your jaw and your ribs. Support head, arms, and trunk. That's going to be your vertebras. Transmit forces of up, upper and lower extremities. Again, that's going to be your vertebra, that's going to be your ribs. And provide stability and mobility of course uh, here we also for example talk about the vertebra the ribs but also some of your facial bones as well okay having said that let's go to the next slide and here we are you can see the uh, skull uh, this is the inferior view of the skull so a couple of uh, important features superior nochial line um, and you can find on this picture for yourself uh, but the uh, way is important because a lot of muscles that neck neck muscles are going to be uh, attached to the superior nochial line foramen magnum is of course the biggest hole or opening in our skull um, for spine uh, for spine and then occipital condyles are very important you can also spot them on um, that drawing and and the, the name is on the right hand side somewhere in be, in, be, um, in between in the middle occipital condyle on the right hand side and you have similar one on the left hand side uh, there are uh, like a prominent projectiles from the skull you can't see clearly on this particular picture because it's the inferior view but if you saw the, those occipital condyles from any other view you would realize that those are like sticking out projectiles from the actual skull and why i'm mentioning them because they are going to be very important uh, and we will discuss them uh, just in a second okay let's go to the next slide here you got a number of vertebras so uh, so so there are seven cervical vertebras there are 12 thoracic vertebras they are five lumbar uh, sacrum consists also uh, of five vertebras uh, and then coccyx confused or uh, consists of four fused um, vertebras sacrum uh, however fuses very early in life and coccyx fuses very early in life as well so as an adult sacrum really looks to us as a one piece of bone and similarly coccyx okay so let's go to the next slide here we have our very important features of the um, vertebral column which is the curvature of the spine and uh, we can divide it in uh, really three important curvatures because the fourth one is uh, you are born with that uh, and no matter what you do that never changes and it's really deep inside of our bodies of course i'm referring to to sacrococcygeal uh, curvature but the three important ones for us and especially from the therapy point of view are the cervical um, um, thoracic and lumbar so cer cervical lordosis is between everywhere between 30 and 35 degrees then you have thoracic kyposis about 40 degrees plus minus couple of degrees of course and lumbar lordosis about 45 degrees 
uh, those of course curvature are extremely important um, to support the weight of our body if the vertebral column would be straight and it's lo uh, located on the back of our uh, trunk that would be no way that um, we could sustain the weight up front okay so let's go to the next slide and here is uh, another view of the head this time uh, sitting on the top of the vertebra and again you can appreciate um, um, cervical thoracic lumbar and uh, sacrococcygeal um, curvature of the spine uh, so let's talk about the vertebras so each vertebra consists of body intervertebral discs uh, vertebral canal also known as or called foramen intervertebral foramen spinous transverse and articular processes um, with facets facets are the pieces which are connecting to the facets of the uh, next bone uh, apophysial joint we're gonna uh, try to spot that on the picture lamina and pedicle so uh, let's go to the next slide where you have actually a picture of it and um, you can actually uh, distinguish uh, the majority the the most important features of the vertebra so on the left hand side picture a it's a lateral view of, of the vertebra and picture b is the superior view so for example i encourage you to find uh, some of the features right like for example intervertebral foramen which is very important because nerves blood supply goes through those openings between the vertebras uh, apophysial joints uh, spinous processes spinous processes are all the way to the back those are the ones which you can fairly easy palpate on the on the back of your neck for example uh, what else can we see over here intervertebral discs are of course uh, between the bodies of the of the vertebras uh, and on the uh, uh, when we take into consideration the superior view of the vertebra there are some features which you can see even better so for example transverse processes spinous processes again uh, look how nicely the spinous process is uh, projected backwards again that's the one which you can easily palpate on the back of your neck you got pentacles you got body and between those bodies where you can find this intervertebral discs uh, so all of those features can be found on those pictures on those drawings so i encourage you to familiarize yourself um, because as therapists you will have uh, patients uh, post for example a laminectomy so what is a laminectomy well uh, the definition of it is just removal of lamina either on one or the other side so let's take a closer look at the at the right hand side the picture b and find the lamina as you can clearly see you have two of them one of uh, uh, each side of the spinous process so if there is a problem with spine let's say the opening is too tight and compressing on the spine itself um, the surgery is needed then the, the traditional therapy usually uh, it's not working in this particular case it's called spinal stenosis spinal stenosis is, is the unnatural narrowing of the canal and therefore the spine is really squeezed in uh, so um, patients are going through surgeries known as laminectomy so in other words one piece or the other not both has to be removed uh, surgically cut off and removed you can't cut off the entire thing above laminas because the spinous process then would have nothing to connect with the rest of the vertebra and that would be a major problem that would actually collapse uh, muscles and ligaments of uh, the back so a uh, surgeon uh, can remove either on one side or the other and it's of course up to the surgeon which side he uh, or she is going to remove uh, 
Um, and again, uh, uh, if you haven't um, encountered patients uh, post laminectomy, chances are that you will, because it's it's fairly uh, common surgery for uh, problems with lower back. Of course, there you have different surgeries as well, like um, if the intervertebral disc become uh, dehydrated and they narrow the gap significantly narrows between two vertebras that itself can cause compression on the nerves as well or bulging or herniations of the discs so sometimes those discs are being um, removed and the vertebras are being fused uh, so the, this is another uh, fairly common surgery so my advice is to know the vertebra know what's going on know the main features of the vertebra because like i said if you haven't seen those patients you most likely will uh, let's go to the next slide okay on this slide um, well on the left hand side this is a superior view uh, of the seven cervical vertebras uh, taken from the same body. So cervical vertebras are the smallest but most mobile of all the vertebras in our body. Okay, um, so let's take a look from C3 to C7, they approximately look the same. The C7 got the spinous process, which is uh, really large and prominent, and you can uh, easily find on the base of your neck. When you bend your or flex your head, you can fairly easily find that very prominent spinal process that's gonna be your C7. Uh, so C3 to C7, they are very uh, similar in a sense that they have the same features. However, atlas or C1 and axis or C2 are much different, all right? So let's talk about those two separately. So C1, knows, known also as an atlas, uh, so its function is to support the head. The vertebra has no body. And if you take a closer look, there is no body. You see that where is uh, set C3, C4, C5 is actually written on the body. So atlas clearly doesn't have it. It's a hole instead of the body, right? Uh, there are no pentacle and no laminas. So this entire uh, vertebra, C1, looks completely different, somehow simplistic. So what it consists of? Only two lateral masses uh, joined by the anterior and, and posterior arch, right? So it's fairly simple. Uh, okay, uh, the superior facets uh, which you can see from the top, they, they, they're looking like two flat surfaces, they actually accept the large con uh, con um, convex occipital condyles. Those are the two projectors which I just mentioned, yeah, sticking out of the skull. All right, so when is this is the brain, the skull, let's say this is the skull, not the brain, and then you got those projectiles right here. Right, so those gonna be your occipital condyles, and those occipital condyles are joining the atlas in those two facets. Okay, so let's take a look now at C2. is dramatically different as well, and on the left hand side you can see it from the superior aspect. But let's take a look at the C2 or or axis on the right picture, and you can distinguish uh, uh, very clearly. Like a, like a mass, like a column of bone in the, uh, sticking in the middle of axis, right? So axis um, has a large body which serves as a base for the dense. Uh, dense um, is also called odonoid process and this is the, the bony column which you can clearly see in the middle of the axis going up and, 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 and on that um, odonoid process or that dense, it's a precise place where atlas sits on the top, 
right so that's why atlas has those two openings one opening is for that dense that's for for that odonoid process okay uh, so this dense provides vertical axis for rotation of the atlas therefore the entire head, okay so the entire head has a much greater rotation because the atlas can actually rotate on that dense or that odonoid process of the axis extremely important uh, joint for the movement of our head uh, okay so axis or c2 vertebra is the heaviest of all the cervical vertebra and is the heaviest because it uh, supports the atlas and the atlas support, supports the skull okay so how important is this well 50 percent of the cervical rotation occurs in atlanto axial region so the connection the joint between atlas and axis gives you 50 percent of the head rotation so where the other 50% comes from is from all the rest of the cervical vertebra combined. Okay, that, that is how important is the, the joint uh, between uh, atlas and axis. Okay, so as we go further down, and you can see that on, on those pictures as well, as you can go uh, uh, down, uh, C4 it's a little bit lighter than C5 C5 is a little bit lighter than and massive than C6 and C7 and so forth so the lower you go the more massive the heavier the stronger the more robo robust are the vertebra okay so and this is for a reason of course because you have less weight over here than down by your waist so the vertebra naturally have to be stronger more massive they and they move differently right so thoracic vertebras are able to rotate so if you are doing trunk rotations this is mostly utilizing the rotation of the thoracic vertebra lumbar vertebra are much better with flexion and extension so if you're bending down or straightening yourself up primarily utilizing lumbar vertebras and we will talk about concrete numbers in just a few minutes all right so let's go to the next slide next slide uh, shows actually those thoracic and lumbar vertebras with with the with basically the same features but as you can clearly see the mass uh, changes dramatically so thoracic vertebra have articular facets for the 12 ribs and lumbar vertebras become thicker and thicker as more weight is uh, sits on the top on them okay let's go to the next slide here you have the sacrum so the sacrum we are born with with five vertebras which are which are somehow connected through the uh, through the connective tissue but they really fused uh, in the first uh, couple of years of our life and then of course uh, as an adult we have this one massive bone primary uh, function of the sacrum is uh, proper distribution of the weight through pelvis to your lower extremities and then we have coccyx. Um, coccyx uh, uh, consists of, uh, let's go to the next, uh, perhaps to the next slide. Yes, we got uh, coccyx consists of four, uh, four vertebras and they are fused uh, very shortly after we born. Uh, and really they do not have biomechanical uh, significance we usually don't think about coccyx twice except when we break it and i had several patients with broken coccyx and uh, this causes extreme pain extreme discomfort people can't sit people can't walk for uh, for, for longer period of time so i usually of course end up ordering adaptive equipment uh, for those patients 
which I'm uh, giving them temporarily only for the time of healing. Uh, after the healing, of course, is done, then they can bend, they can do whatever they, they need to do without the adaptive equipment. But, but during the process of healing is so painful and causes such a discomfort that uh, issuing adaptive equipment is one of the techniques we utilize as therapists. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, we're gonna talk uh, a little bit. We already started uh, talk about joints, atlanto occipital joint, atlanto axial joint, vertebra, costal and sacro uh, sacroiliac joints. So let's go to the next slide. And here we are. On the left hand side, you can see those prominent uh, features of skull the occipital condyles which actually uh, are um, uh, or sitting on the top of those articular facets of C1 we previously discussed and so uh, on the left hand side you have the posterior view on the right hand side you see the same thing but from the anterior point of view so atlanta occipital joint is formed by the convex condyle of the occipital bone fitting into the concave articular facets of the atlas we discussed this already but i gave you like a, a nice definition these joints allowed independent movement of the cranium relative to atlas so this is a neat feature we're going to discuss this in the second part of uh, of uh, this powerpoint when we're going to learn that we can um, uh, flex or extend everything cranium with with the neck or cervicals or just the cranium and we can isolate the isolate that movement from the uh, from the uh, cervical vertebras all right so this joint gives us two degrees of freedom what can we do with that we can flex we can extend but also we can um laterally flex we're not gonna call lateral flexion and lateral extension we're gonna call it lateral flexion to the left and a lateral flexion to the right and of course it looks like this okay so two degrees of freedom so let's talk about atlanto axial joint we also have two degrees of freedom but what can we do with the between atlas or c1 and c2 we can rotate, that's the 50% of total neck rotation. We already discussed that. And in addition to rotation, you can, you can also flex and extend. So it's two degrees of freedom as well. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Ligamentum uh, nuki. Uh, you can palpate the spinous processes and I already mentioned that you can very easily palpate the C7 but you can also palpate others uh, perhaps uh, less uh, readily but, but, um, but with some luck you can, right? So they connect, they are connected with each other by, by supraspinous ligaments, supraspinous ligaments. So the space lateral to the spinous processes and supraspinous ligaments is called liga, ligamentum nuki. It's a very strong flat ligament which, which um, is on the sides, on the sides, both sides actually, of the, uh, of the processes. So that's what I mentioned before, that people who are going through the surgeries known as a laminectomy, lamina can be removed either from left side or from the right side, but, you, but the surgeon cannot remove both laminas because the, the, uh, the spinous processes is directly attached to lamina. So if you would remove both laminas, the spinous process would have to go with it. And therefore, all of those ligaments, which are extremely important for stability of your vertebral column, would be out of the picture. Therefore, you would, your spine would be extremely destabilized. And therefore, you would be, or your patient would be in a really, really big, uh, big trouble. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
here you have to bear with me you have to uh, try to find this on the pictures over here on the drawings so that <coughs> let's discuss spinous and transverse processes first so first what i would like you to do is is find them on the drawing so spinal processes uh, the midline attachments for the muscles and ligaments they are very very important transverse processes are attachments for muscles ligaments but also ribs in of course the thoracic uh, vertebras let's uh, uh, find the apophysial joint apophysial joints between articular facets of adjacent vertebra so so in this very uh, point the apophysial uh, joint uh, one vertebra overlaps with the other vertebra so you have those apophysial joints always two per vertebra one is placed superiorly and the and the other one is placed inferiorly and of course the third one would be inter uh, interbody joint primary bond between the vertebra this joint is formed between superior and inferior surfaces of the verte vertebra uh, vertebral um, bodies and of course that's the place where you can find uh, discs okay so we're gonna take a deeper look at that in the next slide so let's change the slide here we are ligaments of the spine so anterior and posterior the posterior longitudinal ligaments liga, uh, ligamenta flava interspinous ligaments supraspinous ligaments and intra transverse ligaments so so again we have a uh, uh, um, uh, fast array of ligaments uh, the long list of ligaments but just uh, i would like you to remember that all of those ligaments are working for us very hard when we move we we bend we straight ourselves up we go to side to the other side without those ligaments the vertebras would simply scatter our movements would literally damage us every time we try to move so those ligaments are are uh, absolute necessity for our body to uh, not injure ourselves during movement and our body uh, to be strong enough to sustain a lot of activities we do on daily basis so do they uh, limit our motion yes they do they absolutely do limit our motion but for for our own good okay so let's uh, go to the next slide and here we are you can actually see some of those ligaments so uh, please take a look at that and 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 um, and kind of have a mental map what are we talking about here right so on the left uh, hand side you have a ligamentum flavum and and all other ligaments I don't have to read it because it's right here in front of your eyes but they are strategically positioned to keep us uh, strong so for example and the same uh, the same principle uh, kicks in over here like with the wrist for example if you bending forward the uh, ligamentum flavum for example becomes very very tight not to allow you to bend more than uh, you can actually uh, sustain without damaging your body and then the anterior longitudinal ligament of course would become lax to the contrary if you uh, uh, bending backwards of course the ligamentum flavum would become lax and the anterior longitudinal ligament would become very taut and in uh, 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 you know implementing the same logic when we're going side to side those appropriate ligaments are going to become either very taut or lax okay let's go to the next slide here we got uh, costal joints so cost uh, costal vertebral joints articulation of head of the rib with costal facets on thoracic vertebra and below uh, costal transverse joints articulation of 
tubercle of the rib with transverse processes. So again, take a look um, and you can see on both of those pictures the ribs and how the ribs are attached and interact with our vertebral columns and our vertebras bones. So 12 pairs of ribs enclose the entire thoracic cavity. Of course, they, they protect uh, lungs, they protect heart and, and they have active actually role in our breathing. So ribs 1 to 10 are attached to sternum where ribs 1 to 7 are attached directly to sternum and ribs 8 to 10 are attached to sternum by fusing to the cartilage of the immediately superior rib. Let me see if I can, if I have this on the picture. No, I do not. But uh, you can open your anatomy book and the picture is going to be right there. So the ribs 11 and 12 uh, do not attach to sternum, uh, but rather to the abdominal muscles. So they, they call sometimes uh, floating ribs, right? Because those are the only two pair of ribs which do not have attachment either direct or indirect to your sternum. And they are much, much shorter and just embedded into the wall of those muscles, thoracic muscles, thoracoabdominal muscles. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here we are, we are going to talk about sacroiliac joint. So we are much lower right now. So sacroiliac joint is a transition between the end of the axial skeleton and the lower appendicular skeleton. This uh, joint in contrast to the sternoclavicular joint, remember we talk about sterno, sternoclavicular joint, this is your clavicle, this is your sternum, sternoclavicular joint, is a large joint designed primarily for stability. So in upper extremity, in upper extremity, sternoclavicular joint would be kind of like equivalent, equivalent to sacroiliac joint. The difference is that the sacroiliac joint is relatively huge compared to the sternoclavicular joint uh, so and and is um, and is clearly be built for more stability okay sacroiliac uh, uh, is much more rigid than sternoclavicular joint okay so let's go uh, to the next slide Okay, functional unit, vertebra and intervertebral discs. So vertebra and the disc is going to uh, consist, uh, or the functional unit is cons uh, consist of a vertebra and corresponding disc. So functional unit, vertebra and intervertebral disc. Disc is a hydraulic system that is found between the vertebra. So um, imagine um, your car running on a um, brand new car where the hydraulic system is brand new. So you got this nice cushion when you're going over the bumps, for example. But when the older cars, of course, those, those cushions are not working as well as they used to. And the ride is always very bumpy because the hydraulic system is worn off. Uh, so, uh, so think about the functional unit uh, in similar terms, okay? So definitely acts as a shock absorber and allows bending but can tear when twisted. So this is very important for us therapists to know. We have to teach our patients how to properly uh, bend, how to lift objects from the floor, how to lift objects from the tables how to transfer heavy objects from one place to the other. This is all biomechanics and extremely important uh, for therapists uh, to know because we really, really are part of that educational team when, you, when we educate our, our patients and oftentimes fa family members as well. So uni contains sensitive tissue that can cause pain when irritated. Well, we of course, we're going to talk about this. So let's go to the next slide. 
Okay, so uh, so this is intervertebral disc. Intervertebral disc consists of central nucleus, and you can see it. It's like a little a jelly inside the donut, and it's surrounded by a circular annual fibrosis. So it's almost like an onion, right? The many layers of that onion, and inside is like um, it's like jelly, like a jelly donut almost. Okay, so the nucleus purpose is, is pulp-like gel located in the middle, uh, in the mid position, a little bit closer to the posterior part of the disc. All right, uh, it consists of 70 to 90 percent of water. So if, 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 if let's say that this is 90 percent of water, you, you can see how soft and almost pudding-like um, the consistency of that uh, nucleus pulposus I I it is. The, annul uh, the annulus fibrosus, that's the onion rings, so to speak, around it, it's about between 10 and 20 of them surrounding that soft gel-like substance. And those, of course, are made from the tough uh, collagen fibers. Mm. Okay, uh, so let's go to the next slide. Yes, and we can see on the next slide the forces actually acting on the intervertebral disc. So the disc, normally it's able to withstand most of the normal activities of daily life. And they should be okay. They are designed to withstand those. But when you compress the disc and at the same time twist this is the worst case scenario this is where actually this can rupture you can physically rupture those onion like features and they are incapable of holding that pulpus uh, inside the jelly like substance inside and that can cause severe pain of course uh, leading to, to many many surgeries uh, so, uh, bending and twisting, try to avoid this uh, on all costs. Okay, let's go to the uh, next uh, slide. Okay, was uh, studied then uh, examples of force on the lumbar intervertebral discs. So, in human body, the two parts which uh, people suffer from herniations or bulging of the disc are, are uh, number one is lumbar part of the spine and the, and the second to lumbar would be the cervical part okay so study was done which shows that if we are laying down supine do we work um, the answer is yes of course we do we exert the force on our body no matter what we do because we are on earth we have our mass and we have our weight due to the gravitational pull so we are always working no matter what it's just a uh, find the position when your body works the least to relax so supine position would be the optimum the optimum position because you exert only 250 newtons why newtons again because newton represent force this could be mathematically calculated and presented in kilograms or pounds but we don't have to do it because the numbers the mathematical formula here works for itself you just look at the numbers and you understand that supine is the best position to relax standing at ease it's already doubles this sitting unsupported without back support without arm support you got already 700 newtons but sitting in the office chair meaning you got back support and you got your arm uh, rests you dropping that down to um, 500 newtons so can you imagine that actual standing and sitting in office chair actually it's equivalent to each other coughing in standing and that's 700 newtons uh, so if you cough uh, try to sit down 
if possible. Uh, and they, and unfortunately, they didn't put sneezing. But if you have uh, back problems like I do, I had to go through surgery several years ago. And when I cough, was bad. But when I sneeze, was a nightmare. I had to actually brace myself, lean over anything I could find, uh, and, and, or even try not to sneeze. You should see me. I was trying not to sneeze, but sometimes the sneeze just sneak up on you, or me in this case, and I had to sneeze, and that was just hellish experience. Standing forward bent to approximately 40 degrees is already 1000 newtons and lifting 100 newtons, 100 newtons. It puts the pressure on your lumbar vertebra 1700 newtons. So it's, so it's absolutely unprecedented. You can, you can just have the appreciation of how hard your body is working to maintain even the simple everyday activities, let alone sports, heavy occupations, etc. So let's go to another, the next slide. We got spinal nerves over here. So, so you have eight actually cervical nerves, 12 thoracic, five lumbar and five sacral, uh, but we are not going to discuss them in details in this particular course. Uh, so this is enough information for us. And this is the next uh, slide uh, shows another study. Pressure on vertebral discs and you get you have actually two different studies. One is represented with this grayish column, the other one in this black column. And you can clearly see that um, some of those studies uh, two studies were uh, compared and they more or less agree with each other, more or less agree with each other, right? So definitely supine uh, position uh, exerts only maybe I what I can see about 25% of, of the, the 100%, let's, let's call this 100% of uh, of uh, pressure or pull uh, or gravitational pull and that hundred percent you can see when we are standing at ease so that's going to be hundred percent so uh, supine drops to like 25 percent only laying on your side for those of you who like to sleep on your side you actually working much harder than if you would sleep on your on your back Again, supine, you can see on this picture, 25%, both studies are agreeing with that, and laying on the side increases dramatically the pressure on your body. Again, I just mentioned standing straight is uh, 100%, then standing and bending increases uh, dramatically the, the pressure uh, on your uh, lumbar spine. And then you got sitting properly, sitting improperly. Uh, sitting in the recliner chair, then standing, leaning forward and lifting something heavy. Uh, this is the worst case scenario, right? And then lifting the same object, but properly, already dramatically lowers the pressure on your back and standing already with that object lifted up even further uh, lowers the pressure on your lumbar spine. Okay, let's go to the next slide. No, there is no more slides. So I guess we're done with this part of the lecture. Thank you for your attention and I will see you next time. Bye!